screen and let me know if you can't see it. Hopefully this will appear. There you go. You should be now seeing my slides. Like I said, let me know if you're not. Um, first thing to say is a big thank you, not just for the introduction, but to Sophia for the superb organization. Fantastic over email for all my many silly, silly questions. And it's been a real pleasure also to just kind of hang out with everybody today and hear all your papers. Um, as I said on Twitter, it's just it's so nice to hear such engaged, incisive scholarship on something that is, I think, so interdisciplinary and so important right now. Vulnerability, voice, bodies, how to fight injustice and how to do scholarship, frankly, do it well, uh, do it in a politically informed manner. Uh, and in one way or another, I think I could have my own little mini series about how my paper talks to all these other papers. But even having said that, before I start properly, I think I should clear one thing up in particular. So those of you who tuned in today for a 60 minute ode to Body Talk, the seventh and truly banging studio album by Swedish electropop queen Robin, I'm sorry, you are out of luck. That is not my paper today. In the spirit of letting you down gently though, I have put together a playlist of similarly awesome body talk tunes from a variety of artists for your listening pleasure. You'll find it embedded on my blog at this link. Oh, she says, hopefully. There we go. Um, <clears throat> and it also has the slides uh, for my presentation today. If you wanna look at them whenever you like, flick back, do your thing. So having sorted out that eminently reasonable misapprehension, it is time to get down to the matter at hand. It's the matter of matter, as it were. Margaret Ebner's body hurts, her soul too. She scarcely remembers when things were different, when she wasn't sick. The first person account of the German nun's life, her revelations, begins with the onset of an unknown, quote, grave and mysterious illness in 1312. Margaret's 20 and she never fully recovers. For the rest of her life, she lives with a panoply of fluctuating, relapsing and remitting symptoms. Headaches, profuse sweating, breathing problems, paralysis, extreme fatigue, loss of vision, aphasia, musculoskeletal pain, and more. She's bedridden often and for lengthy periods, at least six and a half years in total, she estimates. And it's always worse at Easter time. Her own pain and Christ's agonies on the cross seem to coalesce, to flow into one another with an endless, inescapable intensity. At breaking point on Palm Sunday in March 1339, Margaret screams in a seemingly endless loop. Oh no, oh no, my Lord Jesus Christ. Oh no, oh no, my heartfelt beloved Jesus Christ. Her lament echoes around the convent, a sound as familiar to her sisters and it is irritating. As pious as she may be, she's the religious roommate from hell, routinely screaming for hours, even days at a time. It's not her fault though, not really. She says that she, quote, could not have cried out so loudly by her own power, even if someone had wanted to kill her. Margaret's outbursts, which she calls her outcries, are inchoate ejaculations, the embodied articulation of pain over which the nun herself has no control. Her pain breaks out with violent thrusts into outcries. At times, it's so bad that she thinks that with every scream, her life would end. Kill me now, she begs again and again. All this to say that this pain, this messy business of embodiment is simply too much to bear. Too real. I feel so seen right now. That's what I thought when I first read about Margaret's story. Oh, Jesus Christ. Or more accurately, I confess, oh, Jesus fucking Christ. These words pass my lips not infrequently as I go about my so-called crip life, one shaped by living with fibromyalgia, an incurable chronic condition comprising pain, fatigue, and more. I utter them in desperation, in frustration, in exasperation, sardonically, sarcastically, even playfully, winsomely. And today it seems professionally too. I've not yet begged Jesus to wrest me from this mortal coil, but I do lean hard into my millennial pop cultural heritage. Kill me now, I think, as I channel the OG icon of acerbic critique, Daria Morgendorfer, with a long suffering, sarcastic sigh. 
Darius' eponymous TV show, which ran from 1997 to 2002, was satire par excellence, chronicling the travails of one bespectacled weirdo misfit trying to navigate life in the norm core American suburb of Lawndale, presented mainly through the prism of the ups and downs of cliffish high school life. Daria didn't fit in, and she was proud about that. Proud of her intellectualism, her bookishness, her no fashion fashion sense, her different way of seeing the world. Even if she sometimes doubted herself, falling foul of the pressures to be popular, to be normal, that were imposed upon her by seemingly everyone, her school, her family, society at large. She obsessively watched Sick Sad World, a tabloid show which in a weird way made more sense to her than the bland normativity of life off screen. Kill me now, I say, as I navigate the norm core suburbia that is dominant ableist society, a misfit crip weirdo in proud. Crip theory for the uninitiated is a radically inclusive, globalized and intersectional disability politics. Usage of the term crip is a conscious reclamation of the slur cripple, grounded in a rejection of the compulsory able-bodiedness that structures our culture. It operates for many, though not all, in the contemporary disability community as a, quote, marker of an in-your-face or out and proud cultural model of disability. And most importantly, for my purposes today, crip, quote, has the capacity to encompass forms of embodiment or states of mind that are arguably in excess of the able-minded or able-bodied to disabled binary. As an identity crip, as Robert McCrory contends, has the potential to be simultaneously flamboyantly identitarian, as in, we are crip and you will acknowledge that, and flamboyantly anti-identitarian, as in, we reject your categories or the capacity of languages saturated in ableism to describe us. I don't know precisely how Margaret Edna hurt. I don't know why she hurts even, neither does she, but I recognize a crip when I meet one. I know, I feel her hurt within my bones, within the fabric of my decidedly unholy 21st century life. It feels a bit on the nose to start a paper at a conference on voice and vulnerability by, well, voicing my own vulnerability, but I do so to lend the muscularity of my body, my voice, to those whose bodies and voices have been dismissed, ignored for centuries. I have the profound honor to be a keynote speaker, to have a captive audience to all intents and purposes. It behooves me to pass the mic. Christ's suffering makes sense of Margaret's pain. It offers a hermeneutic framework within which Margaret can orient herself, can carve out a tolerable mode of existence, and in return, Margaret's body, her pain, renders Christ that much more intelligible, tangible even. The son of God bleeds, he writhes, not in some abstracted biblical past, but in the here and now. Simultaneously, Christ's pain gives Margaret's own a kind of signifying heft. Her agonies can no longer be ignored. Finally, people have to start paying attention. And I argue that Margaret's pain can operate similarly for disabled people today. Margaret's pain functions as a proxy for a particularly medieval crepistemology of pain, a process of knowledge production defined by Alison Patsavis as situating pain within discursive systems of power and privilege. Situating pain in terms of crepistemology demands for its recognition as, quote, an experience that exceeds the boundaries of individual bodies. Pain is revealed as fluid, relational, a leaky experience that flows through, across, and between always already connected bodies, a kind of body talk which transcends space, time, language itself. I recognize Margaret's pain, I let it, I let her under my skin, and in return, she makes meaning out of my own contemporary cr chronic life. I enter a state of glorious crypt chronic communion, our bodies talking out of time. What I'm sketching today is an embodied methodology for cripping history, a praxis which, I maintain, has the potential to dilate time itself, and so doing, enact a kind of cross-temporal crip-chronic communion, even in our pandemic present. Pain and chronic illness in the medieval era were understood and lived as integrally productive states, governed by an explicit epistemological compulsion. 
Esther Cohen remarks, in the widest sense of the term, it might be said that pain was seen as an avenue to knowledge, knowledge of the body, of the soul, of truth, of reality, and of God. Whether self-inflicted or caused by others, physical pain was a way of affirming the boundaries of identity. That pain is communicative, that it means something was taken for granted in the Middle Ages. So in this context, Steve LaRocco's 2016 theorization of the semiosomatics of pain, which stresses above all that pain is informational and imperative, seems downright medieval. For the semiotics of pain, as LaRocco argues, is one that, quote, intends non-subjectively to trouble the interpersonal realm, to move and change the tenor of the social reality in which it arises and is situated. The semiosomatic chiefly exerts itself, quote, to generate change, adaptation, or transformation. Its function is to move, not tell, to incite, not represent. The purpose of such signs is not to represent injury, but to alter the social sphere itself by making pain in some fashion forcibly present, to push it into the social realm. The lived materiality of chronic illness in the Middle Ages is ultimately impossible for us ever to recover. Nevertheless, we can discern, if only we look hard enough, feel with enough sensitivity, the ways in which the semiosomatics of chronic illness penetrated the socio-cultural fabric of the Middle Ages, how they disturbed the status quo, and how they might even disturb a contemporary status quo. Even if nobody has been listening, chronically ill bodies have always been talking in the crypt vernacular. With its informational compulsion, pain enacts, quote, trans individual feeling. It's unpleasant not only to be in pain oneself, but to witness the pain of others. Pain that so easily could be our own too, it seems, if our bodies decided to result. As a result, pain is routinely overlooked, slighted, discounted, or denied. Such disinclination to grapple with, to hold space for the pain of others, transcends space and time. Margaret Ebner, for, existence, uh, for instance, speaks plainly of the hard lessons she was forced to learn as she began to adjust to her new chronically ill normal. Gradually, I learned by experience of the world's ways. Those who had once been close to me now kept their distance, saying they could not bear to see me suffer so. Then I understood that God alone remains faithful. He would never abandon me. God's faithfulness is in direct contrast to the callousness of her spiritual sisters, all but one of whom shun her for many years, we learn, after she falls ill. Medical texts from the Middle Ages are similarly unwilling to engage. They often skip over chronic illnesses, evoking them only to move quickly onwards to more satisfying topics. Medical author Ricardus Anglicus remarks in his treatment of disease, the Micrologus, quote, I do not deal with certain afflictions, such as epilepsy, chronic toothache, paralysis, apoplexy, etc., because I think they're incurable, and I could find nothing certain, or the fruit of experience in the authors I've read, though there are some quacks who vainly try to cure them. Throw in some nice shade there, Ricardus. His statements are indicative of the general attitude towards chronic illness espoused by 12th century medical texts from Salerno, site of the first medical school and epicenter of medieval medical research. For at least some medieval physicians then, a lack of existing cure means a condition is not worthy of further discussion, even in terms of detailing symptomatic treatments which may increase a patient's quality of life. Chronic lives are thus effaced for the medical historical record, sublimated into a diagnosis which itself is evoked only to be skipped over as fast as possible. Granted, the chronic presence in the historical record may be somewhat spectral, even inaccessible for the usual scholarly means. But as amply demonstrated by the text of Margaret Ebner's revelations and countless miracle tales, it's there if you actually try to find it. If a body talks without anyone listening though, isn't it all just screaming into the void? The potent semiosomatics of chronic pain and illness, both medieval and modern, fundamentally depend on the presence of an engaged audience, someone willing to listen attentively and crucially to do something about what they've heard. In medieval studies to date, even in medieval disability studies, chronic conditions 
and especially chronic pain, have largely been notable for their absence, apart from big hitter diseases and basically leprosy. That's the one. The clamoring of myriad semiosomatic impulses have been ignored, suppressed for contemporary intellectual discourse and history alike. This contributes to a sense for many that pain is irrefutably inexpressible, unshareable. People in chronic pain become dislocated, not just from the rest of their contemporary community, but from history itself. Paying attention to the traces of pain experience conserved in historical sources then, it becomes a political act, reaffirming the value of chronic lives and underscoring the survivability of chronic pain itself. If not precisely unmentionable, the chronically ill have nevertheless been viewed as undesirable, as the quote, unhealthy disabled in disability studies until very recently. Much necessary work has been done in disability activism to resist and move beyond the medical model of disability. This pathologizing model categorizes the disabled body as de facto diseased, an object that must be cured at all costs to return to quote, normality. The social model of disability affirms the dignity of the non-normative body, a body marked by impairments, but disabled only by society. Chronic illnesses offer a fundamental challenge to this paradigm. The non-normative body itself is the principal site of aversive and disabling experiences. And what's more, the uncomfortable reality is, as Susan Wendell points out, some people with disabilities are sick, diseased and ill. Thus, the rejection of chronic illness as disability equates to healthism, revealing inherently ableist assumptions as to the primacy of health and the value of a life lived in perpetual sickness. It reinscribes a hierarchy of embodiment, first the able-bodied, then the healthy disabled, and finally the unhealthy disabled, followed only perhaps by the dead. Gaps in disability history on the subject of chronic illness as a category ultimately represent fear of perpetuating the medical model of disability. This is an understandable, even sympathetic rationale. Similarly, the reticence of medievalists to tackle chronic illness as disability can perhaps be explained, at least in part, by the worthy desire to avoid the creation of a factual prehistory to the ever present deeply destructive ideology of illness as corporealized immorality. Irina Metzler adroitly describes the prevailing attitude in scholarship, and she writes in 2006, so sadly, this is not the distant past. This belief of modern authors that ancient or medieval societies invariably saw a link between sin and illness appears to be the dominant historiographical notion on the subject of disability. Medieval medical culture was tainted by discriminatory belief. That's the big critique. But modern medicine and Western secular culture more broadly does not just follow the science. This has become all too clear in the UK during the coronavirus pandemic. Healthy and able bodies are paid more attention, accorded more subjective agency, by which I mean agency as subjects, so to a white bodies and cis het male bodies. The coronavirus pandemic has laid bare what people in the UK in the disability community have always already known we are viewed as disposable. Coverage of the pandemic has, for example, reiterated that COVID-19 only kills older people, only kills people with pre-existing chronic conditions. But according to the latest available data, disabled people account for six out of 10 of all deaths associated with COVID-19 in England and Wales. For comparison, the 2011 census found that around 16% of the population were disabled. Disability activist Imani Barbarin reflects on 2020. I knew people were comfortable watching disabled and elderly people die, but I was wholly unprepared for the joy with which people would leap into harm's way under the belief that only the vulnerable would die. Last month in a televised discussion as to whether coronavirus lockdowns in the UK came at quote too heavy a cost, Jonathan Sumption, a former Supreme Court justice, told Deborah James, a woman living with stage four cancer, that her life was, quote, less valuable because of her health status. Rejecting the notion that all lives were of equal value, Sumption argued that lockdowns should be lifted for the benefit of those whose life were, quote, worth more, namely his children and grandchildren, as they had a lot more life ahead. 
challenging such attitudes is more urgent than ever. Modern medical science is not a pure essence. It cannot but be tainted by the human hands which produce its precious knowledge. The medical establishment is system systemically racist, ableist, and cis-heterosexualist. The body talk of marginalized subjects is tuned out, relegated to static on the airwaves. A single tweet provides a disgustingly illustrative survey of the situation at hand. Holy shit, tweeted Kelly Hill on October 2017, sharing a photo of the section about cultural differences in response to pain in a nursing textbook. Pearson actually published this racist bullshit, she marveled. And let's be clear, Pearson, an educational publisher, put out this text in 2014. This is not an unfortunate artifact of their deep, deep back catalogue from days gone by. The textbook spews racist stereotypes handily set out in bullet points for easy memorization. Here, trainee nurses learn, for example, that black patients, note they're referred to simply just as blacks, often report higher pain intensity than other cultures. They believe suffering and pain are inevitable. Chinese patients, by contrast, are nobly stoic. They don't want to make a fuss, so they may not ask for medication. Not so sub subtext. If a Chinese patient asks for pain mess, they must really need them. Black patients, not so much. The textbook isn't some fringe outlier. A meta-analysis of 20 years worth of studies on analgesic treatment disparities published in 2012, for example, found that black patients in the US were 22% less likely than white patients to receive pain meds for similar conditions. In the US, as elsewhere, people of color do not have equal access to healthcare, nor do they have access to healthcare that listens to their body talk in good faith. This marginalization is compounded along intersectional lines with disabled people of color doubly oppressed. It's unsurprising then that black and minority ethnic communities in the UK are bearing the brunt of the pandemic. The Office for National Statistics reports, for example, that black patients are 1.9 times, almost two times more likely to die from COVID-19 than white patients. All this to say, the phenomenon of equating certain kinds of bodies with sin with sociocultural deviance, with being less than fully human, is not isolated to the Middle Ages. Not at all. Engaging with the medieval past on its own terms entails speaking uncomfortable truths about contemporary systems of oppression, and so doing, finding modes of active resistance. Disability in the Middle Ages may have been understood in terms of sin, but this was certainly not the only interpretation of non-normative bodies. Why then the reticence to engage with chronic conditions in scholarship, even by expert medievalists who know the sources? In a nutshell, the medieval conception of pain and illness is decisively impacted by the possibility of mystico medical healing. This is emphatically the case in miracle stories, the genre in which a significant portion of our textual evidence for chronic conditions is found, which routinely evoke chronic pain and illness as conditions solely to be alleviated. So here's the basic anatomy of an, a miracle tale. In an obviously condensed vignette, overwhelmingly diseased patient X enters stage left. Magnificent Saint Y wows the crowd with her astonishing healing powers. Now healed, patient X has become superfluous to the narrative flow and disappears in a puff of smoke as Saint Y takes a bow for the enthralled audience. Superficially, at least, in miracle tales, disabled bodies exist only to be annihilated, fixed into normative able-bodiedness, cured. This resonates all too well with the pathologizing medical model of disability. If cure, as Alison Kafer notes, is the future no self-respecting disability activist or scholar wants, then it certainly isn't a desirable past either. The question is not only how do we deal with medi uh, medieval sources which seemingly perpetuate the discriminatory medical model of disability, but how do we use these sources to challenge our own limited contemporary frameworks? We need to reboot our hermeneutic paradigms, retune our analytical antennae, and tune into medieval chronic illness. It's a station that's never ceased broadcasting, even if we weren't yet in range to pick up its body talk broadcasts. The sources tell us, if only we let ourselves listen, that curative intervention does not always equate to the whole scale annihilation of disability or disabled identity. 
nor does it always lead to the coherent resituation of the marginalized body into mainstream normative society. Cured bodies talk too. Crypt semiosomatics endure. This is the case with Pellegram, a three-year-old boy we find in the 13th century Occitan biography of a holy woman called Dusseline of Dean. Typically, Pellegram is first presented to us as a body in need of healing, a vehicle to demonstrate Dusseline's religiosity. He was, quote, born deaf and mute, so deformed that he had never been able to walk and people would stare at him because of his deformity. He had a hump on his chest and his shoulders and was all curled up. The boy is also afflicted with putrefying cranial wounds. And they're bitter, this is gonna get gory for a minute, so strap in. His head was eaten with fistulas and he has such terrible lesions from them that the dressing they put in them penetrated to a depth of three fingers. It had reached the point that the sores were eating into his skull and one of his ears was so eaten away with the disease that it was barely attached and hung down on his cheek. They expected it to fall off at any time. His whole cheek was affected and even his neck and the smell that came from it was unbearable. The repulsive realities of tending to ever spreading systemic disease are emphasized. Fingers penetrating flesh to tend stinking wounds, the anticipation of increasing bodily fragmentation. Yet sickness is not an indicator of sin here. And the description of the effects of unspecified disease is prioritized over attempts at diagnoses. The boy or rather his body is an object of communal care signified for the unspecified they that anticipate his ears functional demise. Chief amongst these caretakers is his mother, named in the episode's opening sentence as Matiev, a widow at the end of her tether. The smell of her son's wound is unbearable, but so too is the situation she finds herself in. The next sentence testifies. The child's father had died and his mother was extremely distressed. She prayed constantly to our Lord to take him because he was in such pain and source of more and more tears. The boy's pain is invoked in order to be passed over, or at the very least decentered, in order to emphasize his mother's now chronic emotional pain caused by having such a burdensome child. Instead of fulfilling Matiev's wish to uh, mercifully kill her son, God instructs her to take the boy to Ruba, Dusseline of Dean's hometown, and receive the gift of her touch. The holy woman is, predictably enough, moved by the boy's physical condition. What's striking here is the initial focus of attention, the boy's cephalic disease, with no mention of his other disabilities. Dusseline touches his lesions and they immediately begin to heal. In order to ensure that Dusseline continues to heal the child, however, Matiev feigns ignorance that the cure is taking place. She continues to show the holy woman each of the boy's debilities ensuring that Dusseline touches the child, quote, in all the places where he was disabled or deformed. Why would Dusseline stop after only healing the boy's cranial wounds? Perhaps she, without any experience of living and caring for the boy, doesn't recognize his physical disabilities as actually in need of a cure. Or has the boy received his allotted amount of spiritual healing, carefully parceled out in increments by the holy woman so she can treat as many people as possible? Is Dusseline effectively rationing care? Whatever the case, these details accentuate the fact that the curative encounter is performative, dependent on the invocation of specific gestures and the submission of all present to an implicit orienting script. This performativity is further emphasized later in the tale, as the sisters at Rubo warn Matiev to avoid letting on that she attributes the healing of her child to Dusseline. Such recognition would just upset her. So instead, Matiev must present her, quote, completely well child as the object of a more diffuse divine healing, a product of God's great goodness and mercy. After Dusseline's intervention, the boy is cured, his limbs now miraculously unclenched, his hearing and speech returned. This, however, is not the end of the story. For Matiev doesn't know what to do with her cured child, barely even recognizing him as her own kin. Returning home with him, she puts the child, quote, where she usually kept him, tied and wrapped up, alluding to her routine treatment of the boy, both loving and cruel. When he starts walking towards her, calling out, mother, 
She reacts not with joy, but confusion and fear. This could not possibly be her child, for he has the power of speech. Fortunately, a visiting woman has the wherewithal to ask the boy whether he was truly Pellegrin. He confirms his identity. The qualitative weight of the boy's name resonates here. Pellegrin literally means pilgrim in Occitan. This evokes the alterity of foreign lands alongside the tribulations of pilgrimage itself, a quest to pay tribute to God and thus remake oneself anew in his eyes. After his pilgrimage to Dusseline, Pellegrin's subjectivity is re-articulated. He's now accorded a name and the vocal ability to vouch for his own identity. And yet, his mother must be further convinced. She runs her fingers over his miraculously cured head and finds, finally, proof of his identity. His ear had been hanging off his head, but now it's securely attached, held in place by a series of neat reddish stitches which remain perpetually fresh. This offers verifiable trace of Pellegrin's previous physical dysfunction. Though the boy now superficially possesses a normative body, he's forever marked by his disability. And this disability is central to his identity, the role he plays in his family. Nevertheless, Pellegrin's sensory disabilities, his deafness and muteness, have been transferred to Matiev. Speech has become unintelligible to her, no longer an epistemological vector. Instead, she depends on the epistemology of touch to make sense of her reality. It's not just Matiev's aural and oral faculties that are affected. She can no longer believe her eyes and is thus metaphorically blinded. Faced with the full weight of the miracle, Matiev takes her son's place as the disabled node connecting the family, if only momentarily. She runs to her father's house, quote, shouting like a mad woman. Dusseline touched Pellegrin to heal him, Matiev touches Pellegrin to see him, to believe in him, and thus herself be healed of suffering, eventually. Dusseline's healing touch radiates through Pellegrin's body, but his body also operates as a conduit for disability, flowing outwards from him in pathways, in relational pathways. Disability can never be annihilated, instead it's forever reconstituted. In due course, the family appreciates, with appropriately glorying wonder, Pellegrin's healing and give thanks to God. The grandfather urges Matiev to have the child re-blessed by Dusseline, and she proclaims the boy now must be dedicated to the religious life in imitation of St. Francis, so I become a fry minor, as a way to thank the Lord for the healing. The tale ends with a flash forward to the fate of the healed boy, who dutifully followed Dusseline's order and became a Franciscan cleric. Nevertheless, this only represents a pause in Pellegrin's story, rather than a definitive happy ending. Pellegrin's story picks up once more three chapters later. His presence is markedly different from the earlier sketch. Though his former paralysis is noted, no mention is made of the cure of his wounds, which were previously so prominent. The rationale becomes clear as the text reports Pellegrin's episodic bouts of illness seeds of his former conditions reactivated by acts of disobedience. Though Pellegram plans to become a friar, his brother wants him to become a monk. Terrified of his sibling, Pellegram accedes to the plan and approaches the monastery of St. Victor. Pellegram's body rebels against him. Suddenly, he felt a terrible pain in one of his ears that had earlier been cured through this saint's virtue. The further he went and the closer he came to the monastery, the worse the pain became. When he was inside the church and they were about to put the robes on him, his ear, neck and throat became so swollen that he could barely speak and he had to return home. Back at home, Pellegrin rededicates himself to following Dusseline's ordinance. If only she cures him again. Pellegrin's visceral, almost anaphylactic reaction to the monastery happened twice before he gets the message. This brings the total of his cures, counted as discrete episodes, to three. Cures, even miraculous ones, may only be partial or conditional. Although visible signs of disability and chronic disease may disappear, that does not mean that the cured body is unmarked by bodily and subjective difference. In his adult life, Pellegrin's chronic condition is ambiguously framed. On the one hand, it signifies the inescapable bodily link he has to his healer, and his responsibility to God. It thus operates as a mechanism to exert control over his life and his destiny. 
His disability remains dormant in his body, but could in theory come back with full force were he to exhibit bad behavior. However, his episodes of pain and illness are also affirmative. Even in this final vignette, they're not described as originating in sin of any kind. When Pellegrin cannot speak his mind openly to resist his brother's plans, the semiosomatics of his pain expresses his desires. His illness offers vivid testimony as to the righteousness of his entrance into the Order of St. Francis. For despite what Dusseline had said on the matter, the local Franciscan friars were actually disinclined to accept Pellegrin into the community. Faced with his repeated reactions to the Victory Monastery, though, they allow him entry, albeit grudgingly. Pellegrin's entire monastic identity then is founded upon his enduring bodily difference. Life post cure does not equate to a return to able bodied normativity. The non normative body and its attendant subject positions can be suppressed, but never fully erased. Was Pellegrin ever disabled in our contemporary understanding of the term? Can Pellegrin's post cure life and body be claimed as disabled? Do such categorizations really matter for those of us in the contemporary disability community? To answer the latter question, yes and no. Historical representation matters, but rules lawyering about classification of disability is not particularly helpful. What matters is the moment of recognition when we read Pellegrin's story, the moment in which we feel linked to his lived experience of disability in which we see our own lives and bodies reflected somehow in his biography. In that moment, we find ourselves as part of a trans historical chronic crip community. And that community is constructed by the conscious politicized decision to let that moment of recognition unfold by allowing ourselves to claim Pellegrin as crip and so doing claim ourselves as crip. Alison Kayfoot formulates the basic logic of claiming crip as follows. The conscious inclusion of the non-disabled in the crip community, coupled with the refusal of, quote, simplistic binaries like disabled, non-disabled, sick, healthy. The work of claiming crip, she says, is to recognize the ethical, epistemic and political responsibilities behind such claims to force the seal on the hermetic enclosure of normative able-bodiedness. The process of claiming crip brings to the fore a particularly ambiguous area of disability identity politics. What to do about people who may be classified as disabled by others, but who don't identify themselves as such. It doesn't matter, Kafer maintains, whether such people claim themselves as crip or not. Rethinking our cultural assumptions about disability, imagining our disability futures differently, will benefit all of us, regardless of our identities. I concur, adjusting Kafer's proposition only to add that these alternative imagined futures are painted in ever more detail by imagining our disability histories differently. Claiming crip in the manner I'm suggesting is a methodological intervention which exerts the disruptive, disorienting, disjunctive logic of crip time. This temporal mode resists linearity and teleology. It contains not one, but many potential timelines. It draws attention to the way in its lived experience, time dilates, extends, shrinks. Crip time is, as Richard Godden and Jonathan Shu attest, significantly dependent upon the pressures that embodied difference would generate for a person with a disability. It's an integral part of the lived experience of disability, insidiously and often implicitly so. We need more time or less time, different kinds of time. Such temporal disorientation is keenly embodied in chronic lives. The very definition of chronic illness rests upon the inhabitation of an unexpected, a difficult temporal mode. Chronicity dissolves the expected teleology of illness. Those of us with chronic lives exist in the duration, never to reach the end point of health. Waiting for diagnosis, often we feel as if suspended in time. Hopes of cure entail deferral, anticipating a future whilst we pause living in the present. Managing chronic illness means grappling with time, living in episodic fits and starts. The joyous fluency of good days where you get shit done, but the bad days of living in slow motion, of Netflix, of bed. Frequently, we obey not the clock time of neoliberal employment, but instead meds time, the schedule upon which our medications must be taken. Pain thickens time. 
The pain experience, to quote Hellstrom and Carlson, dominates the life situation of the patient, leading to, quote, a feeling of being entrapped in the present. Locked in the painful present, the past and future fade away, becoming harder to remember, even to imagine. Sound familiar? It should do, for this is the logic of pandemic time too. The coronavirus has bent linear time out of shape, forcibly thrusting able-bodied society into disordered, diseased time zones. Time has no meaning and everything has like melted into one, tweets Andrew. This year has been 10 years condensed, one month spread out, fast but, but slow, fulfilling but devastating. March 2020, the temporal ground zero for the sudden onset of our new chronic condition, well, for most of us, it has never ended. We're ossified in its amber. Will we ever make it out alive? The coronavirus has functionally claimed us as CRIP, enfolding those that were notionally able-bodied pre-pandemic into the CRIP community, whether they like it or not. We live chronic lives now, and not just figuratively. The pandemic as a whole has become a super spreader event for chronic illness itself. In December 2020, the Office of National Statistics estimated that one in 10 people testing positive for COVID-19 experienced symptoms lasting three months or longer. Leila Moran, a Liberal Democrat MP and chair of the All Party Group on Coronavirus, reported to the House of Commons last month that, quote, there are 300,000 people living with long COVID in the UK. 7 million worldwide. And long COVID may be the chronic condition most directly associated with the novel coronavirus. It's the one generating the most news stories, but it may well be the tip of the chronic iceberg. Emerging evidence, for example, suggests that COVID-19 can trigger both type 1 and type 2 diabetes in patients. We don't yet know such cases are temporary or permanent. What is clear is that there'll be many, many new members of what I like to call the cool people club of chronic illness. To them, I say hello and welcome. Beyond hospitalizations, pandemic burnout is a recognized widespread phenomenon that is much in common with the commonplaces of chronic life in the before times. Exhaustion for no logical reason, aches and pains that come and go, brain fog, limited reserves of every kind. The usual metrics of productivity, of pace, are seemingly impossible to achieve now. Now that we're on the same crypt time zone, able-bodied culture is finally listening to things that crypt bodies have been saying for years. Chief amongst them is that accessibility, as it turns out, is a thing. Seeming mundanities of pandemic life, such as remote participation and online events, are downright miraculous for the disabled community, who has long been lobbying for such pretty basic accessibility measures that were previously deemed impossible, too expensive, or simply unimportant. Bodily dis-ease, as with Pellegrin's uh, allergies to the Victory Monastery, can be understood as somatized rebellion, the body which no longer does what it's supposed to, the body which refuses to obey the rules imposed upon it by strict structures that seek to oppress. Seen, felt, to the mode of medieval epistemologies, it becomes clear that pandemic burnout in the able-bodied community functions similarly, an embodied involuntary rebellion against the demands of neoliberal capitalism, about productivity at all costs, at all times. The difficult truths that dominant culture could not, would not articulate, are being expressed in the pandemic talk of countless able bodies. The, quote, destiny of SARS-CoV-2 is to become endemic, say experts, at the World Health Organization. At a macro level then, our culture as a socio-political corpus will have to learn to live with, to manage a chronic condition that challenges our understanding of bodily integrity and bodily control and prevailing paradigms of productivity, economic and otherwise. Acknowledgement of the integral interdependence of all our lives, of all our bodies, and commitment to honoring this fact in practice will be essential in our national treatment plan this is 101 level knowledge for the CRIP community. We've been yelling it into the abyss for years. With a similar sentiment now being professed by a Tory government, by ableist institutions and society nationwide, it's a rather uncanny echo. 
Claiming crip on behalf of medieval subjects simultaneously reimagines the past and the future for bodies in pain. It marks the start of a quote, cross temporal conversation, a provisional zone of contact, which allows for an intersubjective encounter. In these moments, chronic bodies flow into one another, meeting and coalescing in episodic bursts of pain and illness, which make disability not just more intelligible, but more alive for medieval subjects and more livable for modern people too. After such chaotic temporal dysfunction is cured and we return to our correct historical compartment, radically transformative traces of our encounter linger, if only we allow them to, if we allow for these uncompromising moments of epistemological kinship. The same is true for the pandemic. The pandemic has crypt able-bodied time, but this too shall pass. No matter what it feels like right now, at some point, the crypt chronic times will functionally end for able-bodied people, at least. COVID-19 will be controlled enough through vaccination or social distancing or new drugs. We may well return at a societal level to the brutally inaccessible before times. And this moment of cultural communion with disability may come to a close. But crypt chronic bodies will continue to talk as we always have. The question is, will anybody still be listening? Thank you very much.